Father, those are my prayers as well. Uh, what is going on in the Middle East today, especially in Israel, is just uh, from a human standpoint, is uh, <clears throat> tragic. But in a sense, at least in your divine sense, there is no surprise here whatsoever. Nothing ever catches you by surprise. And Lord, our prayer is for Israel and, and, and her peace today and safety, that you would watch over them, that tiny little nation that still remains the hot spot in the world, that you, uh, as Mike has already prayed, would be with Netanyahu and those who uh, lead with him, that they will set aside their differences, <clears throat> politically speaking, and do what they need to do to uh, protect their nation and their people. Thank you, dear Father, that <clears throat> all of our hope is in your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, people, can, uh, nations, whatever, they can take our physical body, they can never take our souls, those belong to you. And so the instant that we leave this <clears throat> physical earth is the instant we'll be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and our hope is totally and completely in him. I'm, I'm, I'm confident that there are a number of, uh, there would be a lot of uh, uh, Jewish people who are Christians. Probably, without doubt, part of the remnant. God, would you protect them all? Pastor T.D. called us and said there was someone there that's been called to service. And Lord, they're on alert every day. We don't have any idea what it's like there and the fear they live in. Oh God, our hope is in you. And we pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this caused me to reflect back on some things that I do know about <clears throat> about Islam. By no means am I an Islamic scholar. Uh, I wouldn't even come close to that, but I do know a little bit of the history and, and why we are where we are today at least. Muhammad, of course, was the founder of Islam, was born in 571 AD in Mecca in the tribe called Quraysh, Q-U-A-I-R-A-H, something like that. And they were keepers of an idol temple called the Kaaba, and that idol temple had 360 gods in it <clears throat> that, they, uh, that they worshiped. And, uh, and I'm not gonna give years here up until later, um, <clears throat> but sometime later he decided, he, he, through visions that he had or visitations from Ga the angel Gabriel, he came to the conclusion that there was only one God, namely Allah, who was one of the 360 gods, and he alone was his prophet. So he went back to Mecca to tell her by that, and of course they rejected him out of hand. And uh, it frightened him, and he left. And um, <clears throat> now I'm going to go through some years here, but as time went along, he began to plunder caravans. And as a result of that, he became quite wealthy. And he began to, one by one, I suppose you could say evangelize, and uh, he got more followers of, of Islam and then he went to a town called Yatrib, which is a uh, small community, small town, uh, a Jewish town. And he said the same thing to them. There's only one God, Allah. And Allah only has one prophet. That's me, Muhammad. And they did the same thing. They rejected what he was saying. And he slaughtered all the men and buried them under a marketplace and then took all the wives and children as servants he approached, he approached uh, Mecca again in 628 AD. By this time, they realized that he was now way, way more powerful than the first time. Uh, even though they thought that they could, um, uh, they could uh, defeat him and whoever was following. I, I, I cannot tell you the number uh, of followers he had by then, but, but it, was, it was many. And to the point where they decided that they would have a treaty with him. And it's called a Hudebya. <laughs> Short name is Hudna. And they signed a 10 year treaty with him that is in effect today. No peace. No peace. They will not have peace with anyone. Many, 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 many people do not know that. And the only reason they sign a 10 year treaty is to rearm. 
and then come back again. And so that is embedded in Islam. They cannot sign any peace treaty with non-Muslims. The other thing that's a big deal, way big deal, is this. <clears throat> By the way, that uh, Yatrib was renamed to Medina. That's probably a name you're familiar with now. That's one of their major cities, or at least one of their historical cities. If they control land and then lose that land, that is the worst possible thing that can happen to them. That's an affront to Allah. And they have to get that land back one way or another, through war, whatever it takes. Because they, they believe that uh, if that happens, then Allah is a false god, Islam is a false religion, and Muhammad is a false prophet. And that still is true today. That's fundamental to Islam. They cannot lose land. If they do, they have to get it back some way in the name of Allah. So when Israel became a nation in 1948, that was the worst possible thing that could happen to them. And that's why they became enraged. Uh, it, it began really with the Balfour Declaration in 1917 when, when uh, this is interesting, the very thing that we're studying this morning, five men in the British government believed what, we're, what we believe. They were what we call Zionists. <clears throat> they were believers of all things. And the name Balfour, that was one of the men that it was named for. And they believed that Israel should be allowed to go back to her land. Well, that didn't, of course, obviously did not take place until 1948. <clears throat> and when they got there, you know exactly what happened, right? They were attacked. Because that was not their land. It belonged to uh, Islam. Uh, which, of course, we don't believe that. We believe that, that what, the Abraham, what, what God told Abraham was still true. That land belongs to Israel by divine creation. <clears throat> and so that's the problem that we have today. You know, I keep hearing all these politicians and all the rest. We've got to have peace over there. You will not have peace. It's not going to happen. It isn't. I mean, I would love to have peace. But as long as Israel's where she is, <clears throat> and as long as you have, by the way, she owns one-tenth of one percent of the land. It's about that big around, if you're working on a map. They own 99.9 percent. .9%. All the way from the middle, middle East, clear up and down that area, they own 100 percent of the oil. Israel has nothing. Actually, she has a lot of stuff. So um, <clears throat> that's just a little bit of history. In um, 632, at least uh, most of what I've read, he was poisoned to death by the wife of a um, man that he had killed. There were many, many, many Arabians who decided they didn't want to be uh, part of the Islamic religion by then. His father-in-law, Abu Baker, replaced him. But before he died, <clears throat> um, Muhammad said, if anyone relinquishes a faith, kill him. And that began the wars of apostasy, where 70,000 Arabians were slaughtered to bring them back under Islamic regime. And from that time on, with the sword, S-W-O-R-D, not peace, sword. They went from France all the way to China, and that's where we're at today. Now, that's probably going to wind up, somebody's going to drive by my house and do a drive-by shooting for what I just told you. But that's just a little bit of history. There's way more involved in that than just what I'm telling you. Sometimes I wonder if it's not just like the... Uh, <clears throat> Mormons, right? A 15-year-old kid who had all these visions found in Mormonism. And intelligent, well-thinking people by the millions have followed. That's enough of that. Any questions here? So that's what's going on today. There's not going to be peace. As long as Israel's around, not going to happen. 
But our God is greater than. And he has a plan for Israel. I, I, I think it's really sad that we have so many evangelicals today who are anti-Israel. Which we are, listen, make no mistake about it. Your theology, what you believe theologically, will have a great deal to say about how you live your Christian life. It does. And those of the covenant persuasion who read scripture between the lines and come up with all kinds of things that I, I it just, I can't, I, how could anyone intelligent even think that? And especially about the church in Israel. Now, I, I want to do a little bit by way of review. But listen, here's, here's the problem that I see. That multitudes of young Christians are getting swept away by the scad thousands. Because they're not interested in Israel whatsoever. They're interested in social justice. And we have conferences all over the United States and all over the world where they go by the thousands to these conferences. They also perceive the Palestinians as downtrodden and Israel as bullies, occupiers. They stole land that didn't belong to them. <laughs> Maybe someone should ask God about that. And, and then you have these teachings today, dominionism. That's, of course, from the charismatics. That somehow the Christians are going to take over the whole world for Christ's sake. And when they do that, when that's accomplished, Christ will return. Christian Palestinianism. Have you heard that one? Christian Palestinianism. Look it up. It's not Christian at all. It's anti-Israel. Uh, preterism, which we will study later. That, uh, that, that word is a Latin word for past. Did you know that the people, that, that the theology we're talking about this morning spend almost their whole time studying the first coming of Christ and no time at all in his second coming. Now I'm going to name some names. I could whisper, I'm not going to do it. John Piper would be a big one. Lynn Hybels, have you heard that name? Yeah, her husband Bill started, uh, yeah, Willow Creek Community Church, which was one of the first mega churches up just outside of Chicago, and it became about 25,000 in members. And now Lynn goes all over the world to speak against Israel. Hank Hanegraaff, Christian Research Institute. Now Hank is a way well-known person. These people are all anti-Israel. And what they have... John Piper? Oh, he's the Pied Piper of anti-Israel. <laughs> Yeah, big time. And that's what happens with your... Th I'm sorry? I just, can you explain to me at an elementary level why anybody, like John, any Christian would be against it? I'm sorry. Well, it's their theology. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's what we've just been talking about, covenant theology and reform theology. And so, remember we talked about the covenant of grace. There's only one people of God um, <clears throat> that become a part of the covenant of grace. And, there's, and those people form Christians and the church from Abraham all the way to the end of history. So anyone who is a believer and, and has that, theolo that, that theological viewpoint will, will, will be part of that covenant of grace. And remember, the biggest problem is this. They force all the, the other covenants into that one covenant. The Abrahamic covenant the uh, Palestinian or land covenant, um, <clears throat> Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and the new covenant. And all, this, all the Old Testament scriptures that apply only to Israel, they apply to the church. Now, when we get to the Abrahamic covenant, we'll, a we'll ask ourselves two questions. Is it conditional or is it unconditional? Is it eternal, the promise he made to Abraham and his descendants, or is it temporal? So we'll see that. Christ at the checkpoint. And they have an annual conference along the Israeli-Palestinian border every year. And all these people are there as speakers. 
and they body slam Israel. Youth events, Catalyst Conference, the Justice Conference, where thousands upon thousands co go, because we're way more interested in social justice today. You're not going to change anybody's heart by doing that, right? Not going to happen. Only Jesus Christ can change a heart. <clears throat> Have you heard of the National Association of Evangelicals? Well, they're up to their... I'm sorry, <laughs> i got to wash my tongue here. They're up to their ears in social justice. You can find 65 articles on that site. In fact, if you get on their site, there's a pop-up that you can't go anywhere else unless you work on this. How can you grow in the area of racial reconciliation? Take three minutes to fill out our new racial justice assessment. Now, I'm not going to sound any warning. I'll let the Lord do that. But I don't think we have any clue how the, what's going on with all this. I don't. Because the fact of the matter is there's multitudes who follow the same thinking. They don't think biblically. <clears throat> they think emotionally. You can memorize this if you like. I found this. I have no idea where I found it. How odd of God to choose the Jews, but not as odd as those who choose the Jewish God but spurn the Jews? Right? So Piper says this. <clears throat> Israel has committed high treason against God. A non-covenant keeping people does not have a divine right to hold the land of promise which was given by covenant. Covenant breaking forfeits covenant privileges. Do you want to use this for his verse? Turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. Have they broken his covenant? How have the Jews broken the covenant? According to Piper. According to Piper, yeah. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now, we'll, we'll come back to this later. But this is the verse he uses. <clears throat> you said 15? Yeah, no, Exodus 19, verse 5. You know what, maybe I should uh, back up a couple of verses. And let's just start with the <laughs> first one. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that, on that very day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. And what an experience they're about to have. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. There Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him to the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Now that's the giving of the law, the beginning of the giving of the law of Moses. Piper uses that verse to say covenant breakers have no right to the promised land. The, the, the um, covenant of, at Sinai, uh, the covenant of Moses, the commandments of Moses was temporal. It was never eternal. It was Israel's constitution with ordinances and laws to keep her protected from pagan nations. It was never a part of God's eternal covenants. Never. It was temporary. Now, why do I say that? Because that's what happens when you force all the covenants in that one covenant of grace. And you build your theology on that. Well, then he would have to believe if you sin, you've lost your... Salvation. Oh, please don't. Because that's, that's logically the next step, right? It is. We are of the new covenant. Yeah. If we break our covenant, then we lose our, our right. That's right. That's, that's not a God I would worship. No, it isn't. Um, I mean, listen, would I debate him? You bet I would, in a locked small room. 
with no one there. Would I win the argument? Probably not intellectually. You can't win that argument. Not, 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 not at least the way I see it. I've tried that and it didn't work with my grandson. Now I love him to death. And uh, he and his wife came under the influence of John Piper some years back. Be careful who you follow. And by the way, you have every right to check me out. Period. That's your responsibility. And it's sad because they're winning the day. They are extremely vocal. And they have had incredible influences on youth. And they are not interested in this book. They're interested in their conferences and being led emotionally and those kinds of things. Listen, I've got an emotion too. <laughs> but it comes from what this book says to my heart and not some kind of an experience. And you'd be shocked at, listen, Andy Stanley, of all people, I don't know how he and his father were able to ever reconnect. Of course, you know, he blamed his father for the divorce, you know, Charles. Right? And uh, my favorite Bible teacher, Earl Rodmacher, believed that Prozac is what caused all that. Uh, I don't know that, but he, he, was, he was actually uh, Charles Stanley's mentor for probably 10 or so years. And uh, he was very close enough to know that this, there was, and Andy believed his father. And they didn't get reconciled for a long time, then they did. The nanny decides that we should unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. How's that for standing with Israel? And you know that just this past week he had a three-day conference with homosexual speakers, right? You did know that. I guess I'm done now. But listen, <laughs> what's the difference between here today, around our world, and when the early church began, the hatred among the Syrians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Jews were, was palpable. That's what the church was born in. But was, what was their whole purpose? A name. One name. Jesus Christ. And so, you don't need to turn here. But let me just... Uh, Read a few verses in Acts 2. Everyone who was feeling a sense of awe, the 3,000 now have gotten saved. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the, the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, not communism, by the way. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And many needs there because nobody, had any, nobody brought anything with them. They were expecting to go back home. They were there for, for the Passover. So they took very few possessions with them, and then they all got saved and stayed. So that church was always in need. That's why Paul went out and collected for them. Verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord notice, was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's who they were interested in. Well, that's not where we're at today. We want to do just the opposite of that. They were in the same kind of condition. Now, that was 2,000 years ago. Obviously, they didn't have cars and TVs and all those things and Instagram and whatever else you want to call that stuff. And it's sad. And they have their teachers. And those teachers have great influence. Believe me, teachers have great influence. Let no one, James says in James, what, 3 1? No, let no one be a teacher. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur the stricter judgment.
And I take that very seriously for me personally. Does that mean God's up there with a great big sledgehammer waiting for me to make a mistake? No. But it does mean if you want to be a teacher, you should be very serious about that. This is God's word. It's the most precious thing on earth. And uh, I can remember back in my early years, after I got saved and God gave me the, the privilege of working with some youth, maybe 30 to 50, and I taught them. I didn't know anything. Dumber than a box of rocks. And I don't know how God's going to handle that or Christ when I go to the judgment seat. But, but anyway, but listen, we need to get it right. And, and allegorism isn't right. Spiritualism is not right. Spiritualizing scripture is, is not right. Trying to read between the lines and find something hidden, a hidden meaning is not right. So, uh, I, I suppose that's what we should do this morning, you know, is at least do a little bit by way of review and covenant theology. That's, that's what we call it. And, and it, you know, there were three covenants. The one, a covenant of works that, that be, by the way, that was, that was given to Adam before Adam was created. There's no covenant of works in the scriptures. And so they believe that that's when that covenant was given. It was very simple. Um, Eternal life for obedience, death for disobedience. And of course, I guess if we look back, he sinned, right? And we're all part of that, somehow. So, God moved to help them. And that's when he established the covenant of grace. To take care of the sin and death aspect. And, uh, and Christ, of course, is the mediator of the covenant of grace. Now, it's a second statement. That's not in Scripture either. This is all deductive reasoning or by inference. Um, and then, you know, that one covenant where they put all the other covenants in that one covenant will last until Christ returns or to the end of history. And so when they force all the other covenants into that one covenant, you come up with statements like John Piper would come up with that they broke the covenant, therefore they're covenant-breaking people and they've committed high treason. Now, there was a covenant of redemption, but um, their main covenant is the covenant of grace. And search the scriptures and see if you can find those words. Um, So they will take, they will, well, look with me in Ezekiel chapter 36. Let's turn there for just a moment, just to get an idea of how, they, uh, how this happens. John MacArthur's favorite professor at Biola was a man by the name of Charles Feinberg, who was a, a Jewish believer, a, a tremendous scholar. And... Um, he wrote, a, he wrote a, uh, a commentary on the book of Ezekiel, and uh, it, it's, it's golden. I won't give that one up. By the way, I swiped it from my mother. At the time I saw it, I, I didn't have the money to buy it. I said, Mom, can I have that? Yep, you can have it. And, uh, yeah. So, in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 22, Ezekiel speaking, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you, notice, from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. That does not fit their theology. It does not. That's an eternal promise that no matter what Israel did, God would bring them back. Now, by the way, there's a time word there. 
between verse uh, 24, well, I'm sorry, between verse 22 and 25. Verse 25 has not happened yet. But it will. He will sprinkle them clean. He will be clean. They will be clean. They'll cleanse. They, I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, in verse 26, and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you shall be my people, and I will be your God. That doesn't fit their theology. But guess what? Historically, it's going to happen. So they, they, they just either explain these verses away or they cannot explain them. And I love what Feinberg said in his, in his commentary. They cannot explain this away. They have to admit it's literal truth. Can you all see that? Now, there's many more that we'll be dealing with. That's part of, part of what we've got uh, coming ahead when we deal with the uh, land uh, covenant. So that's, that's the, and oh, by the way, that, that, then, then we have to talk about dispensationalism, right? Just briefly. Two things. We hold to a literal, what, what, what theologians call a um, literal hermeneutic, which simply means we take every word on its face value, its normal, literary um, usage, everyday language. I, I got a little confused about what a foreigner wanted in the store the other day for his car. I guess I asked him three or four times, and sometimes my boss will watch me, you know, stand over and laugh, because it's impossible. You know, some bring, you know, bring their phones and bring some and point to it, and then you have to figure out what they want for their car. And uh, <clears throat> so I tried to answer him the best I could, and I think he thought I was speaking mumbo-jumbo because he had no clue what I was saying, and I had no clue what he was saying. Now, the good news is we finally figured it out. And the, the only way that happened is I had to take him out and have him pull, put his hood up so I could see him and have him, is this what you need? <laughs> and, uh, and that's what we do with language. Well, we've got to be literal with our language and not make our language say something it does not say. But that's what covenant theologians do. I was on a couple of their sites the other day, and I sat there. I mean, I was in stunned disbelief. How could this man have 77 doctorates? Well, probably not that many. But how could he have that kind of education and come to that kind of a conclusion? And I wonder, have any of you heard of James White? He's the head of Alpha and Omega. And he had a meeting in, in kind of a small room with a Muslim scholar, James White, who, by the way, is Reformed, or Covenant, if you want to call it that. And his goal was to find common ground. And I think the tape, well, actually, I found the tape on John MacArthur's site. And MacArthur was stupid <laughs> that White would do that. And uh, this... Muslim scholar spoke in third person. You know why he did that? Because he didn't want anybody to know what he believed. And he believed everything he would say. Well, this is what they believe. And everything he said is, is fundamental to Islam. That Christ, of course, was a prophet, but he was not God. They didn't believe in the re resurrection. All those things they don't. They don't believe. And that's what, that's what we're doing. We keep, we're coming together with us, whatever. And that's what happens when you don't have what I call a literal hermeneutic. Because what happens is now you become the authority and not the author of Scripture. And then, as I've already said before, the, the Scriptures become like putty in your hand. You can just go like this with it and fit it however you want. He knows. <laughs> you don't do that, though, do you? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's what happens. And if you, if you, as I said, I gave up the de debate long ago. I guess I've reached the age where it just wears me out. Um, because you have to work really hard to get anyone to believe 
or agree that there's such a thing as dispensationalism? How could you even do that? What do you mean Israel is separate from the church? Where'd you ever find that at? Well, um, her name's mentioned 2,566 times in the Bible. We could start with that. And the only other name that's mentioned more in the Bible than Israel is who? God. God himself. So, and the two go together, and we will find that out. Look with me again in Jeremiah chapter 31. And, and um, I don't want any of us to get lost in the weeds here with what we're saying. That's why I wanted to do at least a little bit of, by way of review. Um, because, listen, I'd give my life for this truth. And if I do, then so be it. But the fact of the matter is, we have a whole movement going on today who doesn't believe that at all. Certainly the Charismatics don't. I guess you do know that, right? They don't. They're all up in their ears with dominionism. We're going to take over the earth. Physically. They have a seven mountain mandate. I can't remember all of them. Politics, education, communication, all those kinds of areas that they're going to take over somehow. I don't, you know, how's that going to happen? I don't know. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse um, 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, before uh, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. So how long is Israel going to last? Forever. God and Israel together. Can we see that? <coughs> there are those who believe that Israel, the, the Jewish age, died in AD 70. Over, done. With the destruction of the temple by Titus and his armies. And the temple was full of the abomination of desolation. And that's why Jesus, they say, sent Titus to destroy that temple. <laughs> that's amazing. Who says that? Who says that? Jesus? The people that we're talking about, they believe that. Now that's the heart, that's the heart of preterism, which will be looking at here in a few. When we when we kind of like decided to do this series and look, it's it's all I can do is pray that you'd be willing to stick with it because the heart of the Bible begins and ends with Israel. And we're in there together. God raised up the church for an indefinite period of time when Israel rejected her Messiah. We do know that, right? They did. And um, it became a major issue for the early church. Because everywhere Paul went who, and, and went to the synagogues, who followed him? The Jews. They didn't want any part of it. They didn't want any part of the gospel. However, remnant, people were still, Jews were still being saved. It actually began with, um, with the uh, Jewish leadership, right? I mean, there they had the Messiah right in their, fra their faces, and they decided he had to go away. They hated him. And there came a turning point. You might check this verse out. We won't go there. Matthew 12, 24. I believe that is a historical crisis. In Matthew 11, the Lord Jesus Christ rejects the nation. Or the, I'm sorry, the nation rejects Christ. In Matthew 12, the, the Lord of glory rejects the nation. In Matthew 13, have you ever wondered why all of a sudden the Lord Christ decided to speak to them in parables? 
because that whole chapter is parables. Because while hearing they can't hear, and while seeing they cannot see. To you, to you, he said to the disciples, this truth has been known and will be made known. To them, no, because they become dull of hearing, and their hearts have become dull, and they turned away from me. And from that point on, Christ begins to speak only to his disciples. He pulls them away privately. That's what the whole upper room discourse is about in John 13 through 17. But, now you and I, <laughs> I probably said, you know what? You all don't want to trust Christ? I don't want any part of you. You're done forever. Completely done. But God's not that way. God has a purpose for Israel. A historical and eternal purpose. And so even though that, and listen, it went all the way through the book of Acts. Remember in, John, in Acts chapter 13, maybe 46 or 47, they, they followed Paul to Antioch, stirred up the crowds against him, and, and uh, he finally said, you know what, we had to come to you first. Because the gospel always goes to the Jew first. Since you consider yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are going to the Gentiles. And that's where it started. The turning point. One of them. And if it wasn't for Romans 9 through 11, we'd wonder whatever happened to Israel. But then you discover that God still has plans for her. And they're all, all Israel is going to be saved, Paul says. Now, the other school of thought does not believe that. How they can read Romans 9 through 11 and come to the conclusion they do, I have no clue. I don't know. I don't know how they do that, but they do. And so they tell anybody they can find that, the, that Israel's done for. God rejected her years ago. She's a prostitute. That's what Hanegraaff says. A prostituted bride, the church is his purified bride. And they say that everything that was promised to Israel had its fulfillment in Jesus Christ alone. Therefore, Israel has no more of history. God's done with her. And that's why we, we need to understand what God says beginning with Abraham. You know, Abraham was a pagan, right? We all know that. He was from Ur of the Chaldees. And they worshipped a God called Nanner. I used to eat those. I don't eat them anymore. <laughs> the moon god. Um, and that was probably in an area somewhere 300 miles or so south of Iraq. And it was a very sophisticated area in those days. That was, what, 2000 B.C. or more? So he was a pagan when God called him. And obviously we're not going to look at that this morning. So, so the second thing we want to remind ourselves and go back a little bit is the difference between Israel and the church. Uh, we worked on that for a couple weeks, right? First of all, the starting point. It started with Abraham. Israel did. And for 700 years, it began, you know, it just began to build. Through, by the way, it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those three. Ethical Israel. Not fake Israel. Not church Israel. None of those things. Israel as an ethnic nation. And so for 700 years, um, God works to build the nation. The church began, as we already said, uh, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, historically. Now Christ said in Matthew 16, 18, you remember he said that I will build my church, future tense, I will build the, build the church. He told Peter, Peter I call Peter the stone or the chip. Some people want to call him the rock there, but Christ is the rock. I also say to you that you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church. Future tense. And the gates of Hades uh, will not overpower it. In other words, nothing is going to stop my church. Nothing. Not persecutions, none of those kinds of things will stop the church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys, of course, in the scriptures are always a sign of authority. And Peter was given the, uh, the opportunity and the privilege of opening the gospel to the Jews, to the Samaritans, and to the Gentiles. 
Acts 2, Acts 8, and Acts 10. You'll find Peter and those with him. And that's how the church began. And then there are all kinds of things that we, 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 we remember that we talked about last week, that the church could not begin until Christ went to the cross and was resurrected and went back to heaven. And the first thing the Lord, the Lord of the church began to do was gather his raw material, namely Jews and Gentiles, and brought them together into what? A body. And also one new man. Now see that, look with me in Ephesians chapter 2. See, that, uh, that's one of the struggles uh, many of the early... Um, many of the early uh, Jews had. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that God is going to bring Gentiles into this? Hold on a minute. Because the fact of the matter is, as you look back in, in, in the Old Testament and then begin to do, do, do our studies in the New Testament, you, you come to realize that the Jews think they're pretty special people, right? After all, they turned the sign of circumcision, which was simply a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. That's all that was, as, a, as far as meaning is concerned. They made that their salvation point. And then along comes Paul, and he blew that theory to smithereens. But God had his plan for his church. So, in, uh, and Paul's speaking to the Gentiles in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. And you talk about someone going nowhere in a hurry. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, that was a derisive term, by the way, by the Jews, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. Now look at these. Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promises, promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, they had gods that they worshipped, but they just didn't have the living God. So they were completely separate. And you know, of course, there was that wall of separation in the temple. And they had a sign on that one wall. To any Gentile goes by here, uh, through this wall, they would be responsible for their own death. They could go so far and no farther. But notice verse 13, the great but. Always circle your butts in the Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry. And it is with one T. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. I'm sorry, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one place and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Utterly amazing what that one life did. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, now he's talking about the Mosaic law, so that in himself he might make the two into what? One new man, thus establishing peace. And might reconcile them both in one body, notice, to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. That's utterly amazing. And that began on the day of Pentecost with the early disciples. So that by the end, and oh, by the way, when Paul finished his statement to the Jews in Acts uh, um, 13, 13 and verses 46 and 7, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you, the Jews, first, since you repudiate it, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Wow. You see how important the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord is? No one's left out. No one's left out. He brought peace to all on the inside. On the inside. And listen, this is not a racial statement by any means. I've never been a racist in my entire life. My father was. He was a locked-in racist. 
I was not, never. Don't, don't know why that was, but I never was. But Jesus Christ is the only one that's going to bring reconciliation. It will not be political. It will not be anything like that because none of those things will change a heart. Right? None of it. It won't. I used to have a really close friend who was, I can't remember where Luke was, Luke Asharifi. And we, we sat together in chapel at Moody. And he was a sweet guy. Of course, obviously black and African. Maybe from Ghana. So every time we sat together in chapel, we'd sit, he'd sit there and he'd be opening up envelopes and all these checks were flying out of him. And they, I mean, people from everywhere were sending that kid checks so he could afford to go to school and live and eat. I said, hey, would you be willing to drop them a note and ask him to change some of the names to Paul Wright? <laughs> he looked at me and laughed. He said, what would you do with it? Uh, well, <laughs> But listen, and we had a great relationship. Why? Because Christ was the center of our lives. And not some sort of a governmental mandate or anything like that. I guess I've lived just long enough to realize that Christ is the only complete, utter answer. Nothing else and no one else. Certainly not Islam. Um, we need to get over this. It, it's, it's peaceful. It is not peaceful. It was founded by the sword. And they still carry the sword. And by the way, Iran and others are only doing what the Quran says. On 911, they were only doing what the Quran says. They were being true. To the Quran. Now, some people would really debate that, but now listen. The, the honest truth is, there are liberal Muslims as well as there are liberal Christians, right? There are, and they take that liberalism and interpret the Quran differently. But a true Muslim will not do that. And so, as as much as we would not like to think that, they were being true to who they were, and. Those knuckleheads in Iran are doing the same thing because they got to get rid of that little spot of land over there and then everything will be okay. And if we don't have our theological house in order, then we might think the same thing, that Israel is the bad guy. If you looked at history, I studied a little bit of the history of Arafat, and I wanted to, uh, I just got sick, sick. His uncle was the most radical terrorist in the history of the country. I don't remember what his name was, back in the days of Hitler, they were buddies. And he learned from him. And Arafat, yes, Arafat was a master liar, master liar. And he, he, he sucked in two presidents so fast, it was unbelievable how it happened. But you see, that's part of their theology. You know what their, you know what their number one selling book still is in, 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 in Islam? Mein Kampf. Think about that. It's still in their schools. Do you know what they teach their students in, down here? How to be terrorists. It's part of their education. Because they want to continue to per perpetuate their history and generations. I'm probably going to get called. Well, that's all right. I don't care. But that's true. And, and, and so many believers don't really know that. And we gave them $6 billion. And just a few couple weeks later, guess what they did with that money? So when we pray for Israel, don't just pray that obviously God will intervene and put a stop to all this, and I'm, I'm confident he will do that. But we need to pray for Netanyahu. Because this deal with the Supreme Court is, is probably the biggest deal in the history of the country. Somehow he has come to the conclusion, it's interesting that what's going on with our Supreme Court, right? They want to get rid of how many? Six? 
Six out of nine? Would that be right? All the conservatives? They spent millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars to get rid of Clarence Thomas. Millions. And the rest of them. And I, I don't want to accuse Netanyahu. Listen, I'm a huge Netanyahu fan. Always have been because he's, he stands up for the nation. They don't always get things right because they're there in unbelief, right? They're not there in belief. They will come back in unbelief, or I'm sorry, in belief at the end of the tribulation. This return is simply to a, a piece of land, small piece of land, with just a few Jews over there. There's probably more Jews in New York City than there is in Israel. But they are there in unbelief. That set, in a sense, to, in my thinking, um, the prophetic time clock, I call it. So next week you'll see a book that I wrote. And I'll give you exact day and second when they come, when Christ comes. And I'll make a lot of money. Until the day after. <laughs> Until the day after, yeah. <laughs> and the, they'll be knocking on my door. I want my money back. But, but that's, that did set the prophetic timetable. God knows when that's going to happen. But in the end, all will come back. And they'll come back and believe. And maybe we can do a study because there's some, there's some confusion, and listen, uh, about the Millennial Temple, right? You ever read the chapters 40 through 48 of Ezekiel? And man, this, I got to wade through all this stuff. And there are those who take some, some um, really, <laughs> really uh, different uh, approaches to, the, to those chapters. I first of all believe it's going to be a literal temple. I believe it's going to be a place of Israel's worship. I believe she will be doing sacrifices, which, will be, which is what causes people all the problems. But those sacrifices will have nothing to do with salvation or anything like that because she will already be saved. Why do we take communion? To remember Christ. That's exactly what I believe will happen for Israel. To remember what God did for her. As she... As she you know, performs or whatever you want to call those sacrifices. Well, we got to go. We're running out of time. Let's, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time. I am so amazed at you and your purposes for all of us. And we have only just scratched the surface. How amazing it is, dear Father, that you set aside this tiny little nation that had nothing going for her as your own treasure from the beginning, from her inception. When you told Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, my son, Israel, my son, my firstborn, you need to turn her loose. And all the rest of the Old Testament is focused on that one little nation. Now sadly, of course, we know she rejected her Messiah, and that is sad, very sad, but one day she will recognize him. You are not finished with her, as so many think. I don't know what it's going to be like in Christ's millennial reign for all of us. I just know that we will all be there together. And what a glorious, wonderful time that will be. And we will be able to rejoice for, with those Jewish believers who come out of the great tribulation. So thank you for your plan. We want to commit her care to you, uh, to you again today, this morning. And we truly pray it all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Well, next week we will begin the Abrahamic Covenant, Lord willing. Thanks so much for being here.